Hello and welcome to the program. Now, it seems Nigeria's debt profile is not slowing down any moment soon, as the federal government hopes to push its public debt stock to 50.22 trillion naira by 2023. According to projections by the national, the new national development plan, fund plan, I should say, 2021 to 2025, which was launched by President Mohamed Buhari last week, the federal government is looking at borrowing 12 trillion naira between now and 2023. If the federal government's attempt to accumulate about 12 trillion debt between two year, between now and uh, 2023, then uh, that's if it's successful now, it will push the country's debt uh, profile now to 50.22 trillion naira. The plan also pegged the country's domestic debt at 28.75 trillion and external debt at 21.47 trillion, putting the borrowing framework at 45% each for both foreign and domestic borrowing. Meanwhile, the federal government has budgeted 3.8 trillion naira in its 2022 budget to serve it its outstanding debt. Now, as the country's debt profile continues to rise, what impact does this, uh, would, would these loans now have on the country, uh, country's economy? Joining me to discuss this further is uh, investment banker and managing director of Carry Asset Limited, Johnson Chuku. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on the program. And uh, let me say Merry Christmas and... Uh, well, should I say Happy New Year in advance? Happy New Year and thank you for having me. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, now, looking at the plan of the federal government, you know, the plan to borrow 12 trillion between now and 2023, and that likely, you know, being likely to push our budget up to um, 50.22 trillion, is there any cause for worry at all? Certainly, there's cause for worry. Um... We've seen a consistent accumulation of debt in the country, and unfortunately, we cannot really hold on to basic fundamental changes in infrastructure supply in the economy that one can attribute to the amount of debt we've accumulated. So what we've seen is that we are now borrowing largely to meet recurrent expenditure and debt service. Well, some, uh, some, some, look, some, some people would argue with you that... Uh, it may not be com completely correct that we cannot see uh, infrastructure in place. I mean, uh, you look at the Chinese loans, we can see what the Chinese loans uh, are doing for us and the country. It's all part of the debt. The roads uh, projects are going on and all of that. Are those not uh, clear pointers as to how uh, these uh, monies that are being borrowed now are being put to use? Now, if you look at the amount we borrowed and you now compare that to the level of infrastructure build we've actually uh, uh, engaged in the past couple of years, you, they, are, they, you, you, they are not commensurate, commensurate with the amount we have borrowed. It, it's not that you can't point to anything, uh, but the fact is that uh, two things you have to look at. One, in terms of value for money, uh, our current debt accumulation is not, cannot be represented that we're getting actual value for the money we are, we are spending on. It's, um, uh, and if you look at those uh, infrastructure we are referring to, um, and you compare if those infrastructure were built by the private sector, they would have cost far, far less because the government procurement process is embedded, has a, a lot of leakage is embedded in, in, in it. But, but the so question is, does at... the private sector have the funds to, to, to execute some of these projects? Because whether we like it or not, some of these projects, are, 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 I mean, they, they demand enormous amount of resources. Okay, let me put it this way. In the first place, the, government, the federal government does not have one COBO to spend on infrastructure. Every cover the government spends on infrastructure is borrowed. So um, if they can lend to the federal government, they can also lend to the private sector. The key thing is if this uh, uh, infrastructure are being built by the private sector, the government would have been able to raise more money. I mean, the private sector would have been able to raise more money because like I said, the private sector has, is more efficient in deploying economic resources. Let me give you a live example. If you recall, the second uh, Niger Bridge was awarded to private sector in investors under public-private partnership arrangement, PPPP arrangement. And that project was reversed and now brought back into the budget. Between 2015, when the current government came into power, and 2021, that road, uh, the road down, just about 10 percent something kilometers of highway plus the bridge, have not been completed six years down the line, six years going to seven down the line. Has not the project has not been completed. The private sector that it was concessioned to, which was 
Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority with uh, Gilad Berger and other private sector, IFs and other private sector investors, would have built that bridge, completed it in two years, told it, and by now that infrastructure would have been used, be, would have been in, in use, and would have helped improve the ease of living in the country. But the government is still trying to borrow money to build it. And it's making budgetary allocation in piecemeal to a project that has economic value. So that's just a live example. Same project would have been built by private sector operators. Private sector operators had already made a arrangement for their funding to build that project. But unfortunately, it was not built, principally because the government is the one trying to build it from public sector, uh, from uh, budgetary allocation. So that's just a live example of what can happen with private sector operators. The rail lines that we're trying to build from borrowing could be better built by private sector if they are concession to private sector operators. Look at the Lagos about the express road. But as we speak today, that project, that road, Lagos about the express road, has not been completed, principally because the government is building from budget allocation. If it was concession to private sector operators, they would have raised the funds and they would have completed that project. But, but, but you and I also know, let's talk about this uh, Lagos about the expressway. It, it was, I mean, it was con concession now in the past, but it didn't work. I mean, even the individual that that road was concessioned to could not raise the funding to execute the project. Well, let's look at that. Uh, that should actually be a topic of a whole discussion. The, uh, because I, did, I, did, I did a case study on that uh, concession, and I knew in my case study, I, I wrote it when the concession was in, just initially granted, mm -hmm. and I indicated that it was going to fail. Because the process of that concessioning, the process of pu procuring that private sector investor that the road was given to was not uh, the most efficient or most effective way to concession public assets to a private sector investor. There was no competitive bid. The request for proposal was not thorough. There are several weaknesses in that process, and it was basically given for other considerations. A anyway, but, anyway, but that, that's actually not the subject of our discussion. Let, let's exactly. come back to this issue of debt now. And um, uh, I mean, essentially, your own concern is that, look, some amount of the money we are borrowing, we are using for recurrent expenditure, like, for instance, paying salaries. Is that what you're trying to say? It's, it's not just what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Um, if you look at uh, the current volume we've witnessed mm. uh, and you look at government revenue, the government revenue uh, is barely enough to pay debt service. Last year, we spent about 80 billion federal government revenue to pay that debt service. With that, what that means is that the entire, uh, only 20% was left to go into the current expenditure. And if you look at last year's mm. government, uh, government fiscal uh, report, you will realize that every COBO that was invested in infrastructure was borrowed. Every COBO. And most of the funds that we were used to pay salaries and wages and government overhead was borrowed. And once you are borrowing for recurrent expenditure, you are not going to be in a position to pay back the loans when they mature because it's very simple. You've not invested the borrowing, it's been consumed. And that's where we're getting to. That's why we're currently spending about 80 billion dollars for government revenue to service debt. And this will worsen as we borrow more. Which I said we can really afford, we can't afford to continue to borrow because at some point we won't be able to meet debt service obligations. And, and the question to ask, other than um, you know, this issue of turning to private sector and all of that that you've talked about, if, if you don't borrow, what, what exactly is the alternative other than turning to the private sector now for these funds? Because um, the, the, the way I see it, somehow, even private sector funds is limited. No. Interestingly, private sector fund is not limited. And that's uh, a wrong notion that we have. Private sector fund within Nigeria is limited. But private sector fund is global. Um, it's, look at the countries that have quickly built up their uh, societies. Uh, United Arab Emirates, particularly Dubai, where a lot of investment went into. Capital came in from all over the world to build Dubai. In, in India, Russia, Nigeria. Uh, once people see opportunities and they see economic viability, they will invest uh, in that economy. What we are missing is that we are not creating the right environment. We're not creating the right structure that will allow private sector investors to invest in our economy. I, I, let, me give you a, let me give you another live example. Mm. 
cast your mind back to the 80s and early 90s, even to the 90s. Nigerian, United, Nigerian Telecommunications Limited was the sole provider of telecommunications services in the country. Is that correct? Yes. And they were building the masts to expand telecommunications services in the country. And we never had telephone service in rural areas. Today, I'm in my village in Ugwek, and I'm making this uh, conversation with you because there is mast near me. Because private sector was in, in, brought in. If you had told NITEL to bring uh, $285 million times three, which was what the initial uh, uh, licenses paid to the federal government to get spectrum license for uh, GSM, NITEL would have mustered it. Just consider the level of investment that has gone into building masters over the country, bringing optic fiber from Europe into the country, main one, glow one, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, all, all, all those uh, optic fiber. They were all funded by private sector capital. The federal government will not, we need 20, 30 years of saving all our government revenue to build those infrastructure. That's just a live example. And that can be replicated all over the, all sectors of the economy. Call it Transport infrastructure. When I talk transport infrastructure, I'm talking of the road infrastructure. I'm talking of rail infrastructure. I'm talking of logistic infrastructure like the seaports. Today, we don't have a need deep sea port. That's why the fact that we have natural deep sea in some parts of the country. Because the government wants to build it with uh, budgetary allocation. We can't build it because the government does not have the revenue profile. So well, the, you it, need it, to it's, a, it's a good idea then that the government is talking about, um, I, I mean, th this was an initiative launched by the Ministry of... Uh, I think Ministry of Works, that's the highway development, uh, is it highway infrastructure development, where uh, private sector, uh, well, the private sector players now are being invited to, to take part. I, I'm talking about the tax credit scheme now, where they are being invited to uh, help in the construction of setting roads, and then they get tax, a tax credit. And that, that's what we are seeing, for instance, in Lagos, where Dangote, for instance, is constructing some roads, and uh, he would in return get uh, tax credit. How does that... How does an initiative like that now help in addressing issues of infrastructure and plugging this, you know, stopping us from, from this consistent burrowing, so to speak? I, I, for me, that's a, a big mileage that we have achieved by introducing the air factors that has credit. Um, but it has its own limitation, but it's a leap from where we were. Uh, pre uh, currently, what happens is that a company that has strong revenue and uh, likely high tax uh, liabilities can take on infrastructure once they get the Ministry of Works to grant uh, the concession and the relevant, other re relevant regulatory agencies like um, uh, the Infrastructure Concession and Regulatory Commission. Once they grant that concession, you can um, view that infrastructure and reclaim your investment from your tax credit or even sell the tax credit to some other company. Mm. So that gives opportunities for some level of infrastructure build, particularly road infrastructure. But we need to go beyond that. And going beyond that would mean that you need to also concession some commercially viable road infrastructure to private sector investors who are actually going to build that road, toll it, have access to the right of way um, over a period of time, and recover their investment, and then pass back the assets to the government under what you call build, operate, and transfer. transfer. That, that way, you will actually increase the tempo of this infrastructure build because the limitation of what the investment tax credit, the, the uh, inf road infrastructure tax credit is that it will be only by companies who have high tax liability because they have viable economic uh, uh, activity or viable uh, huge level of profit. So they are subject to high taxes. And they are going to use, instead of paying the tax to the government, use that tax liability to build the infrastructure and use it to defray the uh, amount they have spent. Of course, there are also some margins built into the process. But to further fast track that process, I think we need to go beyond that. Mm. We need to develop a template that will encapsulate the legal framework, the commercial framework, and the regulatory framework for concessioning of economically viable infrastructure to private sector investors. Nigerians too will need to change their attitude about some of these uh, investor, I mean, some of these private investments. Because you talk about road tolling, for instance. Uh, truth is that uh, a number of Nigerians do not buy the idea. They do not like the idea. They just believe the government has to do everything. You take the Lagos State um, Lekki Toll Gate, for instance, is a clear example. Uh, I mean, you know as we speak now, people are only paying that toll grudgingly. I mean, th there's just no doubt about it because at some point the state government was forced 
to like buy back the project? Okay, uh, there are two things we have to recognize here. One is um, the need to sensitize the public, hmm. which you have mentioned. The need to educate the public on the value or the benefit of having or paying a token for efficient infrastructure uh, uh, compared to having no infrastructure and paying nothing. The cost of not having the infrastructure and paying nothing is far above that of paying a token to have the infrastructure. So we need to educate the public. The other aspect is that the public government also has social responsibility. The co issues around the Loki toll gate are multiple, uh, multifold. One is that the toll gate by uh, uh, the first toll gate there by uh, the hotel, the Oriental Hotel, is wrongly located um, because you really don't have an effective um, uh, freeway for citizens to pass. A toll gate, a road, a toll gate should be a viable, efficient. Uh, um, route that is economically efficient for people to take. The challenge you have with the toll gates is that the road was not properly built. Ideally, if you go to other countries where you have federal toll road, you also have a local road that is not tolled you can take. That's also good. And then the toll, the toll road is a freeway. Freeway in the sense that you don't have to be in traffic. If you have to commute from Aja, for instance, to Lake Phase 1, and you're going to pass through if uh, you're paying to use that facility. You should expect a minimum standard of service on a, a toll road, mm. which is not applicable on this road. So you find that you'll be in traffic for four or five hours to commit for six, seven kilometers. And you're still paying toll for it. Elsewhere, if you go to a place like Houston, the toll roads are flyovers, what we call flyovers, uh, or overpass. So you're on a, a highway, you're paying for it, but you know you get there on time. We don't have that. I understand. What Nigerians want efficient service. If you give me a toll road and I can commute uh, 20 kilometers in, in 10 minutes, I'll be happy to pay. But if you toll a five kilometer road and I'm going to spend four hours on a five kilometer road, I'm, I'm being punished. And some of the logic we've actually enunciated is that the government, instead of having the first toll, should add it to the tenement rate of tenant uh, landlords in Lake Phase One. They would rather pay that and have the confidence of commuting than being a, a psycho <laughs> <Anyway>. without coming <laughs> out. That's I say, the, the issue I, of the toll gate. I understand, I understand you. I mean, so that we don't turn it into a discussion on lucky toll gate. <laughs> but Johnson Chuka, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate, uh, we appreciate the fact that you, you made out time to speak, uh, to speak with us. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, we'll take a short break now and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Now, frustrated by the unceasing reign of terror and banditry in his state, the Kassina State Governor Aminu Masari has officially approved the resort to self-help and has asked his people to acquire weapons and defense against terror and banditry. Masari, while addressing journalists in the State House uh, earlier in the week, specifically said, quote, it is Islamically allowed for one to defend himself against attack. One must rise to defend himself, his family and assets. If you die, while trying to defend yourself, you'll be considered a martyr. It's surprising how a bandit would own a gun while a good man trying to defend himself and his family doesn't have one. End of quote. Now, justifying his action, Governor Masari said, Katsina State currently has less than 3,000 police operatives, which are not enough to tackle the situation. And to be candid, that's quite abysmal. Masari went on to state that his government would be willing to help citizens acquire arms with the condition that the arms are... The arms are registered with the police. Now, but will this not lead to a breakdown of law and order? How will this solve the problem of banditry and uh, terrorism? Not just in Katsina State, but uh, across the country. Do not also forget that a um, few weeks ago, the Southwest governors also called on the federal government to allow Amotekun, Amotekun operatives now, to carry AK-47. So let's discuss this further. I'm now being joined on the program by the Margin Director, Beacon Consulting Limited, Kabir Adamu, who is also a security consultant. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kabir Adamu, for joining us on the program. Um, what do you make of this proposal? 
Um, thank you, um, Deji and Stevens. Um, greetings. Um, His Excellency, the Executive Governor of um, Kazina State, um, is uh, he leads, you know, in a political sense, um, a whole state, and one would expect that his statements will be statements that are aimed at reinforcing provisions within our constitution. Uh, one would also hope they are statements that um, reinforce the provisions that are under um, the social contract. Now, it is true that uh, his state and several uh, parts of Nigeria are challenged by several security issues. Um, in fact, it can be debated that his state is at the forefront of that challenge. Um, however, there are solutions that would reinforce the constitution, and there are solutions that would maybe solve immediate challenges but create uh, bigger challenges. And his recommendation, I think, falls within this, that last um, group that I, I, I mentioned. Um, it, the, the country's constitution at the moment um, only provides for uh, two types of um, legal weapons. One are those agencies within the security architecture that are allowed constitutionally to bear weapons, and there are about nine of them. Now, there are also um, the process through which private individuals can acquire um, weapons, and that is guided by the Weapons Act, which says only the president, and by extension, when he delegates that authority to the inspector general of police, um, that is it's only in that instance that anyone in Nigeria can appear, can acquire um, arms. Now, once you don't fall into these two, two categories, then any weapon that you have is considered illegal. Hmm. So uh, I've listened to uh, Governor Masari's statement, and I didn't hear him refer to that Weapons Act. I didn't refer him, uh, hear him refer to a call for a review of the Constitution to allow what he is recommending. Well, but, um, but he did to, say that provided uh, those who, who, who would provided the weapons, so to speak, are, are registered with the police. So d doesn't that meet part of the conditions that, uh, or part of the provision of the, the, the Weapons Act that you, you referred to there? Um, it does, but the Weapons Act is also very clear uh, the, on the types of weapons that um, the Inspector General of Police mm. can, like, can license. Um, you know, when you tell, you know, your residents, uh, people of your state, to acquire weaponry, and then by, in retrospect that this police will support them um, in ensuring that those weapons are licensed, there is a gap there. Now, the, the, the gap is this. You are a governor you are supposed to help maintain constitutionality. And you've given more or less an open blanket uh, directive or order or approval, as it were, for everyone to acquire a weapon. Mm -hmm. And my worry is that Casina State, um, you know, sits within a location where we already know that weapons are being ferried into the country. They have access to gun running channels. And these guns are not the double barrel and pump action weapons that the Inspector General can, of Police can license. Um, these are military grade weapons that we already know and we've seen um, in Katsina uh, are being ferried in by all these gun running um, channels. So it, it, it's a little, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the governor's statement without all of these conditions that I would, I would have hoped he, he would have mentioned. Okay, isn't, um, isn't this a man speaking out of frustration, considering that, look, He's thrown everything at this problem, but uh, the, the problem just wouldn't go away. He came up with, the, with this uh, amnesty initiative. Uh, at some point, it seemed to work, but, but then it, it eventually collapsed. He, he, you know, several, several initiatives have been thrown at this problem, but none of them has worked. And Thank uh, you. he's pretty frustrated that uh, you know, nothing is happening. So he's, he's desperate, probably, to, 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 to save his people and check the, the menace of this uh, uh, bandits and terrorists. And, uh, you know, a situation where you have, he says, less than 3,000 policemen to provide security for uh, a state as big as Katsina. That, that is, that's the challenge. Um, so, uh, again, thank you very much. It is a brilliant um, question. 
Uh, Governor Masari, uh, with due respect, is a member of the ruling party, the All Progressive Congress. Uh, he comes from the home state of Mr. President. Um, he's also a former speaker of the House of Reps. So more than anyone, frankly, in the country, both within and outside the ruling party, I think he's got the platform to seek for additional support that are constitutional uh, beyond what this, what I consider a worrisome uh, you know, demand by, by him. Um, there are several other solutions that have not been considered that um, are, are constitutional, and I'll quickly mention some of them. Um, the Lagos model of the um, Security Trust Fund. Trust Fund. Casinas doesn't have that. Um, in fact, it's on record that someone has accused uh, the government of Casina of using um, security issues, including yes. the security, as an avenue for sy siphoning revenue. That person, as you, all, you very well know, um, was at the yes. point arrested, and that issue is, has never been clarified. So that's one. W what the transparency around um, managing um, security budget uh, within the state, I think there is room for improvement there. Number two, the retinue of expertise that are available to him to address the security challenge. Um, yes, uh, states like Kaduna and Zamfara, and I think Sokoto State, have elevated the position of the special advisor that they have on security to a cabinet position. Um, I, I'm doubtful if Katina has done that uh, yet. And even if that has been done, what is the capacity and capability of the person that is occupying that, that position? Um, then number three, the regional um, arrangements, the Northwest and North Central are probably the only two regions in the country that are not uh, currently considering regional arrangements to address the security challenges. Um, other regions have done it. You, in your intro, you mentioned Amotekum, and we've seen the effort that the Amotekum um, you know, measure has, has contributed to managing security within the Southwest. Uh, why, when you have a region, a state with, that is bedeviled with such, such challenges, why are you working alone? Number four, um, working with the federal government, increase international collaboration. We saw an attempt by the Zamfara state government when he reached out to the government of the Republic of Niger. Hmm. Now, I would have thought that a more proactive measure would be for the states that are affected, in particular Katsina, um, Zamfara, Sokoto, and to an extent Kebi, come together uh, with the support of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs approach the Nigerian government so that they have a structured approach to managing this porosity of the border that allows the influx of um, these gunmen with their weapons and drugs and other things that they use to, you know, that they have become a menace, as it were, to, to that society. And then thirdly, um, or rather fifthly, um, the resilience of the local population. There is a dislink between the local population residents and what the government is doing. The, the, Majority of Katsina residents have not been embedded into the security architecture of the state. And you cannot win um, that this type of um, security challenges if the people feel you, you know you are not carrying them along. Um, so in a nutshell, these are things that I believe are more constitutional and that will probably give us a more and far-reaching um, effect than calling on people to arm themselves. Finally, before I let you go, we, we're seeing this growing call. This... Um this call for arms now, or call to arms, if you like, is uh, not just coming from Masaru. We've, we've seen other governors to make this call as well. The governor of Benue State, for instance, we've seen this call from, from other groups as well. Of course, I did talk about uh, the Southwest governors, even though in the case of the Southwest governors, they are talking about Amotekun, uh, which is the, like, uh, yes, Amotekun, the, the vigilante group set up by uh, the, the Southwest West, uh, governors. But then we're seeing these growing calls, and quite understandable, these calls are, are just um, a, a result of frustration, if you like, over the security situation in the country. But if these calls now grow louder, do you think we might come to a time when the government might, might, might just yield? Um, again, a brilliant question. Um, for me, whether the government um, yields or it doesn't, people will protect themselves. Um, it's happened in Mexico. 
because of the drop situation in Mexico, where cartels were controlling swaths of land and they were challenging the supremacy of the authority of the state and the monopoly of the use of force by the state, um, you know, the level of insecurity in Mexico reached a stage where, uh, as it were at the moment, uh, localities, uh, you know, arrange their own um, security, uh, you know, arrangements, as it were. And, sometimes outside the framework provided by, by the government. Mm. So it's a natural consequence if people would protect themselves, whether government sanctions it or not, especially in this instance where the government is responsible for that protection and it's failing. So eventually people will protect themselves. Now, um, what some of us are worried about is that that kind of call should not be coming publicly from, gov from you know, government officials, official. especially at that level. Now, with the option they have, First off, they are members of certain security councils, such as the state um, security council, and then at the national level, I think the economic council, and then uh, a few other councils. Now, th those are where policy decisions are taken, and that is where they can move for certain amendments um, at the constitutional le level, where uh, you know identified individuals who have been put through a process will now be allowed to, to have licenses for owning weapons. Um, but when you make such a call without making clarifications and giving conditions, the average person who listens to you and who sees you as the um, you know, final authority, you are the governor, you are the final authority, he or she would take your word on the surface and he would go ahead and seek to acquire the weapon. And the consequence of that in the long run is that uh, that social order that we are afraid has already collapsed in Nigeria will continue to collapse. What happens when we deal with this problem and then we now have another problem of weaponization, which, by the way, we already have. There are too many weapons that are out there in the hands of individuals and non-state actors. And in the, the best way would be to structure the use of those weapons and not to add, ask people to get more weapons. The consequence of that would um, affect the future of Nigeria, if not make this country, unfortunately, an ungovernable state. And, and the truth is that, look, there's no certainty that some, some people in Katsina State have not started arming themselves following the call made by the governor himself, even though um, th there's been no official approval, so to speak. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about those conditions have been met now, even though it's more like a proposal. Truth is, some people may have taken his word, uh, hook, line, and sinker, and start arming themselves. Exactly. And, um, you know, I, I have a barometer um, platform where my consultancy, Beacon Consultancy, we monitor uh, such uh, developments. And frankly, for a few months now, we've been monitoring that. Um, societies, uh, villages, wards in the northwest, in Katsina, in Zamfara, are already seeking for ways outside the government platform to protect themselves, and that includes the, acquire, the acquisition of weaponry, as well as the acquisition of, um, for lack of a better word, influence, where they pay uh, these non-state actors and they are, whoever they are, is controlling them, and that gives them some le leeway for some period. And um, again, I want to emphasize that it's the natural inclination, it's the natural uh, reaction. People would protect themselves. Mm. They are not going to you know, lie like chickens and be killed. But the essence of governors is to ensure that that protection is done in a manner that helps us and not in a manner that would create bigger problems. We already have a problem in our hands of small arms and light weapons mm. proliferation. We should not contribute to it. We should manage it. Dr. Kabira Adamo, Managing Director of Bacon Consulting Nigeria Limited, a, con a security consulting firm now based in Abuja. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me and um, Happy New Year in advance. Thank you very much. Well, that's how much we can take on the program this week. We thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye and Happy New Year.